each question, you'll have one minute and 30 seconds. The sign indicates 30 seconds left to speak. Rebuttals, you'll have 30 seconds and two rebuttals each candidate. Any questions? Very good. All right, I just want to tell you I stayed up till 11.30 last night doing these, and uh, they might not make any sense at all. <laughs> all right, here we go. Let's talk about your qualifications. To we have open statements. All right, sorry, I did it again. Come on, Diana. All right. A one-minute opening statement to tell us that. Uh, thank you, and first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I, I want to thank KVPM, uh, Joe, John. Uh, it was good to see you guys. I appreciate you guys hosting this today. Um, as most of you know, my name is Assemblyman Gregory Hayden II. Uh, I'm running for re-election for my third term. Uh, I'm a fifth-generation Nevadan. Uh, I'm an A-rated conservative. I've been A-plus rated by the NRA, A-plus rated by the uh, Nevada Firearms Coalition, and I've been endorsed by Nevada Right to Life. Uh, just about every major law enforcement agency throughout the state, uh, I'm backed by business um, and our construction industries. Um, last election cycle, I was President Trump's world chair uh, to try to help get him reelected. Um, and I've received multiple awards on several occasions for my conservative voting record. Um, and so having said that, I'd just like to say that, that I'm not gonna run on issues. I'm running on my record. I've proven what my record is. I'm a proven conservative. So thank you guys. Hi, my name is Matt Sadler. I'm, a, I'm your local neighborhood bondsman. I'm born and raised here in Nevada. I've lived here my whole life. Went to school, high school out here. Went to college at the university in Las Vegas. Uh, I love it here. I've chosen to, to spend every waking moment of my life in this, in this, uh, in this area of Southern Nevada. Uh, I have a beautiful family, beautiful wife, beautiful kids. I love them. I love the people in my district. I love Pahrump. Uh, moving here three years ago was absolutely the best decision that we could have possibly made uh, in my last three years. I've been doing business out here for, for years, but in the last three years, hundreds of conversations with, with, uh, with the wonderful citizens in Pahrump. And I hope that you would, uh, that you would look at me as a successful businessman, uh, someone who's brave, uh, this pandemic and different obstacles to make it to where I'm at to keep viable. Uh, I'd hope for your consideration. Uh, and as the debate kind of furthers on, I'd, I'd love to explore more into into the policy ideas that I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, for coming out. And I'm fired up that this town is all about politics. Thank you. Okay, we can go a little bit into your qualifications um, for state assembly. Can you talk a little bit more about your professional background or qualifications specifically for this job? Assembly in Haven. Uh, thank you. So, as I've mentioned, I have a proven record. Uh, I've been to Carson City. I'm now running for my third term. Um, I've served on, on Ways and Means, the Interim Finance Committee, uh, Health and Human Service, and formerly taxation is now called revenue. Um, I've also served in three special sessions, which have not been very kind to Republicans. Um, I'm sure you guys saw the governor shut us down, called us in a special session. Um, when we were up there, the Republicans all signed on to a, a demand for a special session to limit the governor's powers. Uh, we don't think what he did was right, and we wanted to, to send a message to him, telling him that this needed to end. And what, what started out as 14 days went on for how many months? Uh, the next thing is, is I know a lot of you know that I've introduced a bill for voter ID. It's long overdue, and we need it in the state of Nevada. The voters demand it, and we're going to do it. Thank you. Yeah, specifically my qualifications are uh, I love the state. I want to represent the people of Nevada. I'm born and raised conservative <laughs> ever, ever since I was able to vote. I've revered the Constitution. I see you know, playing out in real life what I was always afraid of, having a tyrannical government, too big of a government, invading all avenues of our lives. And I believe we need principled conservative leadership in Carson City, uh, in the state, in the nation. And I think we have a chance this time around. So not only in this race, but in every race that you're, 
that you're voting in, this primary season especially, um, not talking about my competition, but it's, it's well known that in certain places you have to have a certain letter next to your name to maintain viability. And the thing is, I've always believed in the Constitution, I've always believed in conservative principles, and they work. They work in my business. I'm uniquely qualified because I'm still here. Uh, probably two or three out of every four bonding companies in the past eight or nine years have failed. Uh, I'm, the proof is in the pudding that, uh, that I'm still here. I moved the business over from Las Vegas. I wasn't hurting out there. I didn't have to move it here. I did it to, to improve my lifestyle and my way of life and be around more like-minded, involved residents like you guys. And, uh, and I love that. And again, let's pray that, uh, that you would consider me. Thank you. Are there any rebuttals? All right, let's go to what do you think the most important issue that we are um, that we are facing in our state? What do you think is the most important issue that we are facing in our state? Mr. Stafford. Fundamentally, the largest problem that we're facing in our state is a, is a large, overblown government. And we've seen that in the past two years uh, with our governor. He has overextended his, his uh, privilege to rule by fiat. Uh, what we need to have happen is to have effective legislation that's going to rein in the powers of the government. Uh, I know we can probably agree on that. What, it, what I probably disagree on is are we sending the best leaders up in Carson City who are actually going to be able to do that? I know in the minority party it's a little more difficult, but in my heart of hearts I know that we have the best ideas that work. We have the ideas behind limited small government and we need effective legislators up there that are going to actually press that home, build another larger consensus, and really and really affect change up there in Carson City. And and I think I'm I'm qualified to do that. I've I've heard a lot of uh, a lot of stories, a lot of complaints, a lot of issues from my constituents. When you call my Bell Bonds company, I'm the guy you get. So at one in the morning, I'll be the guy at the jail talking to you. I've had hundreds of conversations in this entire county. I'm upset that we got redistricted. I'm upset that lots of my fellow uh, friends in Amargosa, Beatty, are no longer here. And I don't believe we did enough to stop that from happening. And Monday morning quarterbacking is not sufficient right now. And that's what I feel like our legislators have done. So uh, I think the biggest problem we have is the Democrats are in control. And what I've been working on is to get the Republicans back in control because until we get back into control and take over the governors, the Senate, and the Assembly, we're going to be sitting here in the same position. You can say you're going to do anything you want, but you're not going to get it done with the Democrats in control. So number one priority, the biggest issue for this state, is to take back and turn it red. Period. All right. Is there any rebuttals? What legislation would you support or introduce if elected or re-elected into office? Civil in nature. Thank you, John. Um, so I've actually got a growing list right now. Uh, the first one, I think everybody knows that yesterday I, I introduced a bill uh, request for voter ID. It's long overdue. Almost 80% of the population in this nation have demanded it, and it's time that we do it. The next thing is I've co sponsored or sponsored over a dozen bills for school choice. We are now seeing what's going on with Clark County School District, and it is completely unacceptable. The next thing is, is I have sponsored, uh, co-sponsored two bills to limit the governor's powers. I am challenging whoever our next governor is to actually be the one to bring that bill himself or herself. I think that a governor that is willing to limit their own powers sends a message to the people that they genuinely care about this state. After that, I think we deserve constitutional care, don't you, Joe? And then from there, I've also got another bill um, last session that I carried to help cut the government red tape so doctors can get reciprocity across state lines in these desperately needed areas that we are lacking throughout the state. Thank you. Mr. Shadlin? Okay. Yeah, a couple bills that would be super important for me to, uh, to introduce, co-sponsor, be involved, back up. Um, the first one, <coughs> veterans. Veterans, are, our county is filled with them. You know, they need, they need, some, they need some breaks here and there. In my business, for some strange reason, our state legislature, and this is going back decades, decides to give me a break and give me a, uh, 
basically an exemption on my business license fee and then my yearly renewal business license fee. And I think it's time to go ahead and reward the veterans and get a bill sponsored. This should be a bipartisan, easy one to do, to go ahead and limit that. Because I feel like if, 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 I, if I had to pay that extra $500 to start my business in the beginning, I might not be here right now. So I think the veterans, even more so than a bell bondsman, would deserve that same kind of treatment. Uh, again, I'm 100% on board constitutional care. You can check my record, Facebook posts on a loud mouth out there. I've been wanting this for years and years and years, and I think that's an excellent bill. Lastly, I know I said two, but here's a third. Medical freedom, we need, a, we need effective legislation like you're seeing in states like Florida that codifies and limits the government on their overreach on our medical freedoms. Without the back, no, no more mandatory vaccines, no more mandatory uh, shots, tests, anything of that sort. We need to codify them in a, in a good, solid piece of legislation. Thank you. What current or past legislation do you not support and why? Mr. Sandler. Well, AB 321 was a disaster. That's what kind of gave us uh, this election debacle that we have right now. Uh, but more importantly, you know, something that might, you know, be a little bit different than most politicians would say is that I don't think our state legislature should have a, a direct say in how the local uh, sheriff's offices, police departments are run. I don't believe there needed to be a law that was passed that would go ahead and, uh, you know, eliminate ticket quotas. Why I don't care about those, if I get caught speeding, I deserve a speeding ticket. I could care less if there's a quota. I could care less if there's speed traps. I'm for rule of law. I'm for supporting law enforcement. I'm not for micromanaging sheriff's offices or police departments. So that type of bill, uh, I'd like to turn back to. Thank you. Quick rebuttal. Uh, I actually was the only legislator to vote against AB 116 that decriminalized traffic tickets. Um, so I just. Um, sorry. The, 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 uh, the most difficult bill for me was in 2019, Senate Bill 179. Um, it had to do with abortions. Um, in, in, I'm sorry, I'm going to get a little choked up. I'm, I'm pro life, I'm, I'm endorsed by right to life. Um, I have a son who's five years old, and I can't imagine the bill that came in front of us. The, the bill, I, 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 I kid you not, you're probably not going to believe me, it allows 12-year-old girls to have an abortion without a parent even knowing. I didn't sleep for a week when that bill was coming in front of me in a hearing because I was so disgusted with unacceptable. Do you have any more I just have one quick remark. Um, we're not really allowed to ask questions, but um, I'll put it out there right now as far as pro-life record, pro-life uh, pro stances. I'm 100% unabashed pro-life in every instance, no exceptions. And uh, I know that's a politically risky endeavor to, uh, to undertake because nine out of 10 people who say that they're pro-life will always have a list of three, maybe four uh, exceptions. And I don't believe in that. So that's that. What do you believe is the most pressing topic facing our veterans at this time, and how do you plan to address that issue? Assembly uh, Thank you. Um, there are a lot of issues, um, but, but first and foremost, our veterans have earned their benefits. Um, they shouldn't have to wait in line at a VA. They should be able to go to any doctor that they want and get any kind of treatment that they need. They fought for our country. My grandfather's a veteran. And there's no way that any veteran should ever have to wait in line to get the treatment that they have earned. Yeah, one of the biggest uh, issues that we have with the veterans, I would say, would be uh, you know, mental issues. Uh, veterans are a proud group of people, rightfully so. And a lot of times they're not the first ones that want to sit there and, and kind of complain. My dad was one of them. I don't know what kind of baggage he carried uh, through his years, even though it was only a couple of years in the Vietnam era, but he didn't really, wasn't really one to, uh, to want to talk about that. So I think their mental health, uh, the suicidality in veterans is enormous uh, when you compare it to just the standard population. 
uh, there's steps that we can take to go ahead and have the, uh, a public-private partnership, I believe, uh, getting, getting the different agencies on board, whether it's the sheriff's office, the nonprofits, the churches, the uh, faith-based organizations, really put out a public, uh, a, a public mission out there to, to reach out to these veterans. A lot of it is an information related. Lots of veterans, including my dad, didn't realize there were certain benefits that he had uh, that he probably never exhausted or used uh, you know, before. He, he wouldn't even park here in Home Depot. So, I mean, in the veterans parking, he always said, well, there's probably a veteran that's more, more injured than me. So, I mean, uh, proud people, rightfully so. So, as an assemblyman, I would do everything in my power as the opportunities arose to support and, and advocate for them. Thanks. As an assemblyman, you represent everyone in your district. Would your political party affiliation affect your decision in the Nevada State Legislature? Assemblyman Hinton. Yes. I'm, I'm a proven conservative. I'm an A-rated conservative. Pretty sure the R after my name stands for Republican. Can you just repeat that question one more time, Deanna? Sorry. As an assemblyman, you represent everyone in your district. Would your political party affiliation affect your decision in the Nevada State Legislature? I mean, it's, it, it's a rare thing that it would ever uh, affect any convictions or core principles in my mind, but it might be on listening to all sides, whether you're an independent, uh, independent American, uh, libertarian. I'm open to listening to any and all good ideas. That's how I've thrived in my business is I'm not afraid. I'll take any idea out there that works and I will implement it. Now, if it goes against my core convictions, absolutely not. I'm a constitutionalist. I, I revere the constitution. I, re, I revere limited government. So anything that kind of violates those parameters, uh, it's probably dead in the water anyway, but I'm not above listening. You know, when, you, when, you, when you call me, when you get an appointment with me, when you're emailing with me, if you're on social media with me, when you got me, you've got me, and you've got my ear, and I will make time for you. Thanks. In the rural areas here in the state, residents find it hard to get quality health care. What ideas do you have to improve access to physicians, dentists, and mental health professionals? Mr. Sadler. I think there are probably different steps and uh, using the bully pulpit of, of, of being a, a, you know, a leader in the assembly would be possible to go ahead and advocate for, uh, for situations like that. Um, can, you, can you rephrase it? Can you give me one more little synopsis of that question? Sorry, I just kind of I looked at my notes and I was told not to, so that's my fault. I know, I'm, that's yeah, why I keep getting my chair. I've lost my chain of thought. Um, do you have any ideas to improve access to physicians, dentists, and mental health professionals here in the world? Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep out of uh, out of the realm of possibility to uh, allow uh, tax benefits at the state level that can be used in rural areas to make the business climate better for doctors and providers to relocate out here. What happened with Obamacare years ago sort of decimated certain things. Controlling the, the reimbursements from the doctors and the providers is a huge issue. When you, have a, when you have a lot of folks like myself, I can't afford to have grade A insurance as a, as a self-employed person who purchases his own insurance. So I'm not exactly the appealing type of client for a lot of these doctors like you might have in Vegas where people have better insurance or cash payers. So I think to level the playing field, legislation would be in order to allow benefits to, to move more providers into the rural areas, especially in Nye County. Thank you. And so, um, again, I'm going to harp on what I've actually done. Um, in 2019, I brought forward a bill to, to actually try to recruit doctors to the rural parts of the state um, with a uh, trying to do some sort of reimbursement for our doctors that were going to the UNR at the time. Uh, if you spend five, ten years in, in the rural parts of the, the state, we'll help you with your tuition. Um, there's about 45 or 48 other states that are currently doing that. Um, so I, I brought that in, in 2019 and the, the Democrats killed it. Um, this last legislative cycle, I decided, well, the Democrats are still in control, so let me try to simplify this a little bit. I carried a bill, I kid you not, the bill would allow doctors to have reciprocity across state lines and volunteer their time, not get paid. 
The Democrats turned that down. At the same time, the governor, right after that, decided to issue an emergency directive to allow doctors to come to the state and have reciprocity and get paid. And I'm like, I'm a Republican and I'm saying I want to allow doctors to come here and volunteer their time and the Democratic governor won't allow them. So I actually went to the group, it was remote area medical that was, was looking and trying to help me get that bill passed. And I go, you know what, just pay the doctor <coughs> minimum wage and go down the road, it's gonna be a lot simpler because our governor doesn't like you. Uh, to, is there any rebuttals? What are your ideas on how to keep healthcare costs at a minimum for all the methods? Mr. Sadler. Yeah, um, allowing allowing competition across state lines is a, is a huge factor. So any in any way, shape, or form that we can, you know, unify the Republican Party to go ahead and back something strong that's going to allow for that is going to be the way to keep the cost down. Uh, this hyperinflation that's been started under under Biden, uh, the influx of money going into the system, the influx of of people coming across the border that that utilize the same services that, that we all have to use. It's, it's a problem that's exacerbated at the federal level that the states end up paying the consequence for. Um, and the residents of the state to have their costs the way that it is, uh, it's, it, there's not a clear cut solution for that um, that, I can, that I can think of offhand, but other than the competition across state lines uh, to keep the prices down. And uh, full, full disclosure of the prices of medication, different things like that, it's weird that I can get a prescription at Walgreens and it's a vastly different price uh, at Walmart. And a lot of that is a, is a process of just transparency. You know, I spent probably 80% more on one of my prescriptions for no apparent reason, and it still uh, haunts me at night, so there's that. Uh, thank you, Deanna. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, I've carried several bills to try to help bring doctors, get them reciprocity. I, I still think that that's one of the biggest things that we can do immediately, right? There's there's other states that are basically telling doctors, hey, if you can get vaccinated, we don't want you here to go. I'm saying, bring them, come on over. Come work over here in Nevada. We want you, we need you. Bring them on over here. The other thing is, is we've now got the UNLV Medical School. I think we need, desperately need just to expand our residency and fellowship programs so those doctors stay in the state. We are spending millions of dollars educating these kids, and if they leave and do a residency somewhere else, odds are they're not going to come back. I want to keep those doctors here and expand the residency program to do that. The other thing is, in 2019, I actually co-sponsored a bill to actually help add more transparency to the middleman when it came to prescription drugs, and we actually did um, add a little bit more transparency in 2019 with uh, Assemblywoman uh, Hardy. i got to give her a shout out because she was the primary on that. Um, and so those, those are the things that I look forward to bringing next session. Any more buttons? Young and old are dying every day. There's the result of drug abuse, especially from opioids, <coughs> including heroin. What is your plan to combat this heartbreaking crisis? Assembly Nathan. First and foremost, get the Democrats out of office. Uh, no, I know you see you laughing, I'm not kidding. There was a bill last session brought by Dr. Warnmaker, a Democrat from Las Vegas. He's got a, a he's a medical doctor and a, a juris doctor, and he's a teacher. He's never spent a day in the real world in his life. He literally brought a bill to allow heroin injection sites in the state of Nevada like they do in San Francisco. How well does that work for San Francisco? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So rather than spending our time and resources preventing the fentanyl from coming across the border, they want to incentivize people by giving them locations to go and shoot it up. First thing we need to do is get rid of the Democrats. Period. Amen. That's good, Sam. Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge issue. You know, I don't know the exact percentage, but the vast, vast, vast majority of these drugs are coming right over our porous border. When it's happening in, in, uh, in cities that will call themselves not sanctuary cities, Las Vegas is kind of one of them. I know just firsthand kind of how uh, the revolving door of their, their process of, of letting people out on ORs and things like that for drug crimes, not cooperating with ICE when it came to uh, uh, doing the proper reporting and set them up for, for deportation or at least a hearing.
kind of cutting them loose, sometimes even offering them to have bail on, on uh, criminal felony cases where they are not documented here, documented here legally. And what ends up happening is I, out of moral conscience, I have to, dis I have to just not take, up, take those clients on. And the thing is, if we don't cooperate with ICE and with federal law enforcement, the laws are on the books. If we become a state like California with the sanctuary policies, uh, we're doomed. That's one of the big causes. You get when you get caught trafficking this stuff. Unless you unless you're caught like the second or third time, oftentimes you're not seeing prison time. I'm a rule of law type person, and I believe that our penalties should be stricter and more severe in all in all localities, in all courts, district justice courts. They need to be more strict. And uh, if it takes uh, laws in the state of Nevada to make that happen, I'm willing to sign on for a bill like that. I have to tell you, the reason why I laughed is because you were saying that I put this together, that I'd be shooting up heroin because there's Democrats in charge. So I went to that really quickly. That's what they want you to do. See, that's where my brain went right when you said that. And I was like, all right, here we go. With global warming so prevalent, Nevada and the country, for that matter, is focusing on solar and wind energy. Do you support that natural resource? And if so, how would you achieve that goal without encroaching on towns and neighborhoods with solar farms in close proximity? Mr. Sadler, I'm, I'm all for renewable energy. I think that it's great. When ideas are good, I think the, the public sector and the private sector uh, cooperate in a way that the public sector kind of leans back and if the private sector can make money at these things they should be let let's do that when, when it's not that way you have a government like ours that's picking winners and losers we're adopting laws that, that make us turn uh, renewable or clean energy by a certain time I think that's dangerous I think we all see what happens right now at the federal level and at the national level with what, what's happening to our gas prices when you have a government that goes ahead and has an agenda and wants to pick some winners over others. At the end of the day, I don't want to pay $5 a gallon of gas. I don't want to go to California and pay $6.50, and I don't want to go to Death Valley and pay 9 The thing is, solar power is great. I'm not sold on the industrial solar farms, and I'm not sold on the, on the windmills. We call it clean energy. How do you dig all that stuff out of the out of the earth? Do you do it with solar power and go ahead and power your huge monstrous trucks to go dig the, the metal out of the ground? You don't. It's a dirty process. Right now we need fossil fuels still, and I I'm not in favor of imposing, like we've done, imposing these restrictions and these due dates that are gonna come down our throat before we know it, and we're gonna be in a world of hurt. If we think it's bad now, it's gonna get worse if we don't stop it. Clarification: uh, There was actually the voters that passed the 2030 initiative, and um, are you answering the question? Or just... I'm going to answer the question. Okay. We're talking about renewable energy. Yeah. It was the voters that, that passed that. Um, when it comes to solar, I, I have a serious problem. Uh, where they're building the solar fields right now here in, the, in our basin, uh, that those are my favorite off-road trails, and I'm adamantly opposed to those being closed. And there's it's a bigger reason than just the, what the voters passed. The voters said, yeah, we want to go renewable. Well, we're almost there. Those solar fields are selling power to California. That's a bigger problem to me. You're closing my land that I, I've grown up riding out there because California wants us to supply power. And now it's an even bigger problem because the Democrats have decided that we're going to subsidize and give those guys tax abatements. So now we're subsidizing California's energy prices by giving tax abatements to all these solar farms that are going on our land, in our backyard. I am adamantly opposed to that. I understand the voters passed that in 2030 we're gonna build renewable. I get it. Do some rooftop if that's what you want. But don't close my land and access to me and my family and my friends and my constituents to supply California with power and subsidize it on top of it. Is there any more yeah, quick rebuttal. Uh, when it comes to the solar issues, um, you know, I was at a couple of those meetings. Um, you know, I, I don't pretend to go to every meeting, but I, but I think that was super important when they were trying to do that out here in Nye County, the Rough Hat Project. Um, and I'm not the only one who noticed that that our that our current assembly person, that our that my opponent, wasn't that vocal against it. It, it took a lot to kind of see uh, where that support was, and I just am curious to. 
to why that wasn't just made a lot more clear right off the bat. Yeah, quick rebuttal. Um, so what I did is I called our county commissioners and I go, you guys ain't gonna let this pad sell you? And they're like, hell no. I'm like, good, thank you. Sorry, any rebuttal? All right. Quick rebuttal. I guess I like surprises because uh, I'm surprised by that. Yeah, this is the first time hearing it. Any more? All right. Gas prices are through the roof. Do you have any ideas on how the rural areas in the state could receive more funding for public transportation? Separate and Haven. That's a great question, Dan. My first answer that comes to my head is elected Republican governor. Um, but no, it's it's a it's a it's a very difficult situation. I mean, we're we're talking about public transportation, and do we do we want a bus system? Um, I know that we currently have a, a regional transportation commission that's done through the county, and I think that that's the best place for it to be. Uh, I don't think that the state really should be involved in that. Mr. Yeah, as a free market type person, uh, it's difficult for me to go ahead and, and uh, in one hand say I want you know government that's that's small and tiny, and on the other hand, go ahead and say let's just throw money at an issue that may or may not actually solve the problem. Uh, the county is so vast. This whole the, our assembly district is still one of the largest ones in the state, even after it was re redistricted and geographically shrunk a bit. Uh, so, as far as assembly 36, that that's going to be a real difficult thing uh, to get to get done on the government on the government dime, because uh, as we all know, there's 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 so much waste, fraud, and abuse out there. And when you earmark certain funds for certain things to get done, we all know you know, marijuana sales and funding the schools and different things like that. It just doesn't always come to fruition. Uh, so I'm very hesitant on that, and I would prefer a, a free market solution, a, a capitalist solution to that problem. Uh, if there's a way to make a profit at this, if there's a way to have it done, I think the ingenuity of the people of Nye County and the Assembly District 36 can make that happen. And so we will come How would you address the water shortage that we're facing here in Nye County and across the state? And what do you think about the Nevada Water Doctrine known as use it or lose it? Senator Nathan. Thank you, John. As, as a lot of you know, this is dear, near and dear to my heart. Um, one, of the, one of my family businesses is a water company. Um, so I am constantly uh, watching this and monitoring this and doing everything that we can uh, to conserve water. Uh, we've implemented very strict landscape uh, tariff pages and rules that say that you know you can't have grass in your front yard anymore. We live in a desert. Um, now this is just for my utility service area. And what I can tell you is that we actually don't have a shortage in my, uh, my utility. Our water table has actually been rising the last couple of years, uh, which is actually a very good sign uh, for our area. Now I can't speak to the rest of the basin because that's a different water utility company. Um, so I don't know their, their exact situations, but uh, to me, it, it's all about conservation. Um, that, that is one of the biggest things that we can be doing. Um, and, and just being smart with our natural resources. As, as far as it comes across the state, um, you know, we continuously see drought. Um, we continuously see Lake Mead uh, going down. My, my brother sent me a very sad text earlier today uh, that they're closing boat ramps at Lake Mead because the water table is so low. I think we need to be doing more, talking to California and Arizona uh, to get that need back up. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to pretend there's not a water issue. You know, we do have to get to the bottom of it exactly where we stand on it. Um, but what I have seen since the, the water order from the engineer in 1293 came down years ago, I see that being an assault on, on private well owners and, and private uh, folks who are just looking to access and utilize their 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 lawful right to their two acre uh, feet per year. Um, I looked at my water bill recently, I'm wondering if that's what's actually just done for me, but, uh, and it's, it's, it's good. Uh, yeah, we use probably, we're on pace to use maybe one seventh of that type of an allotment, you know, and, and we're a family of five people in the house. I think instead of going on full on assault against people that are good stewards of the water, because I think people left to their own devices and their own freedoms are not gonna be huge water wasters. They're going to use below a certain allotment, kind of like my family does anyway, just organically. We don't do it to save a dollar a month. We do it because that's the water that we need, and we're good stewards of our water. So having, uh, having said that, 
there's other practical things that we can do. These salt cedars, these tamarisk uh, trees out, and I know we've, we've tackled this issue at different times. Uh, they're taking up around 200 gallons of water a day, some of these mature trees, some of these bushes, these weeds, they're invasive species. Uh, that's affecting the recharge rate, no doubt, when the water's not leaching down and getting back uh, through the aquifer. And that, that's an issue. So let's, instead of uh, focusing our attacks on, on well owners, let's, let's make sure that we're attacking the right thing, attack those salt cedar trees, and be good stewards of our water. Is there any more questions? And if there's not, just talk to wait for that. You're right, right? She said wait Do you have a rebuttal? You're up. We're good. Okay. Uh, so I, I appreciate you bringing up the salt cedars. I totally agree with you there. That's why we actually uh, recently, within the last two years, removed 45 acres of salt cedars from our area um, because that, that was something that when I was on the planning commission, we did. We implemented uh, an ordinance to require people to remove the salt cedars when they want to develop their property because a salt cedar uses 200 gallons a day and since you brought up that you're a customer, uh, I believe the average customer is right about that per day right now. Um, and so one salt cedar is basically one household. Any more rebuttals? Are you worried about your water now? Your customer? Hold on, I'm going to have to change out one more. I, have a, I, I threw all my batteries in one bag. This is my on hold music. Hopefully that'll work. The memory's not here, right? She can't watch it for me. Okay. If this doesn't work, then I'll find another one. is expensive. What are some of the ideas that you have to help Nevadans get a higher education? Mr. Sandler. Yeah, I'm a product of that, uh, that type of school system where I put myself uh, through college working a couple of jobs, seven, eight dollars an hour. There's no way in heck, even just for inflation, kids can do that. Uh, the, the other side of the coin, I don't think most kids should. I don't. I, I honestly, I look at my own children. I don't think uh, I'm worried about their secondary edu or their education when it gets to that level. Um, I'm in favor of of people paying their own way and finding a way. Uh, I think one of the problems with the, the out of control prices, in addition to inflation, is the ability for free money. An 18 year old kid can get a hundred thousand dollar loan. They can't get a five thousand dollar business loan. Probably why? Why is the money just being thrown at them so easily? Uh, this is a huge problem, and what that does is it puts the pressure on on what I, in my honest belief, believe to be. For most kids that do it, including the kids I went to school with at UNLV, who were probably like me, not a bondsman, but some other job where they haven't dusted off their degree in 20 years, uh, didn't need it. You know, so I think this focus on this type of education uh, and, and paying for it, I think it's overblown. And I think the chips have to fall where they may. If college gets too expensive where most kids can't go, the prices are going to have to come down. So I'm not in favor of boycotts a lot of the time, but if you don't have a kid that's on a track for a profession where they are going to require a degree, consider a trade school. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I... Uh, I've mentioned that I'm a huge school choice advocate. Um, carried almost a dozen bills, our co-sponsor. Um, and one of the things that, that I've seen up in Reno is the Ace Charter School. Uh, it's a high school where kids can go um, and become general, basically become general contractors when they graduate high school. We need more of that throughout the state because we shouldn't be talking about student debt. A lot of kids, like, if we could get them into the trades, I mean, these are great paying jobs right out of high school. You can make six figures within five years out of high school going into the trades. Um, and so I want to see more charter schools like that being brought throughout the state. In regards to the state portion, um, we have the Millennial Scholarship, which was the Tobacco Settlement Fund, um, which is excellent. But I do think that we need to make sure that the requirements for the kids that are going to utilize that are the kids that genuinely need to go to college and want to go to college, not just, I don't know what I want to do, so I'll go use this scholarship uh, for the next four years. 
and your bio. Once again, in 2022, Nevada has ranked 49th in the country as far as education is concerned. The only state below us is Oklahoma. We're 49th in the educational attainment, 42nd in school quality, 46th in best school systems. What do you think, why do you think this is, and what would you do to fix this problem if we haven't put too much on you already? Assembly the Nathan. Thank you, and this is near and dear to my heart. There, there's no reason at all for us to be 49th in the nation. Um, one of the things I mentioned is school choice. Huge proponent of school choice. But there's another part of this that, that needs to be discussed. Right now, the Clark County School District is the fifth largest school district in the nation. We're 49th. They're the fifth largest. Do we not see what's going on here? How do you manage something that's that large and have those kinds of results? In 2017, there was a bill passed that said the Clark County School District had to come up with a plan to break up. They haven't done it yet. Why? Well, the Democrats have been in control and they haven't made them do it. It's time that we make them do it. Now, there's a ballot initiative out there to allow municipalities to opt out. And I can tell you right now that in the old District 36, the Moapa Valley, they desperately want that bill to go through and ballot initiative to be passed. Because right now, their kids go and play football. They drive all over Southern Nevada. They get home, it's dark outside. They have no way of turning the lights on the parking lot to empty out the bus. So the, the parents turn on the headlights of their vehicle so the kids can safely unload the bus. To me, that's not acceptable. The parents should have the ability and the schools should have the right. If they want their community to have their own school district, they should be able to do it, period. Mr. Yeah, I think in, uh, in the state of Nevada, what we have in the education system is not a, is not a, uh, a problem with the money that we're throwing at it. Uh, our per pupil spending is right up there with a lot of different states. Uh, a state comes to mind, Utah, which spends a lot less per pupil. There, by these metrics, are a much higher performing uh, state when it comes to scholastics. Uh, with that being said, I, I don't believe many times in these one size fits all uh, metrics and, and testing. I believe the kids need to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, history that's not uh, riddled with uh, CRT ideology and different types of uh, political leanings and sex ed being forced down the throats of kindergartners or first graders, some of this stuff is a huge issue. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking our eyes off the prize. We need the effective legislation that's actually gonna fund uh, the money following the kids. I, I, and even if not, I believe that if you wanna take your public school kid out of any failing public school, high school, you should be able to do it. You know, The competition is going to breed excellence in our schools. And it, at the very least, it's gonna take us out of the, bed, the basement on these, uh, on these metrics. There is practically no access to jobs, training, or education for the mentally or socially disabled in the rural parts of our state. This halts the most individuals' ability to thrive. Do you have any ideas to address these issues and bring access to real jobs, training, or education in the rural areas? Mr. Sandler. Yeah, again, this is one of those topics where I think uh, the, the degradation of the nuclear family of, uh, of principles that we founded this country on have permeated almost every aspect of our life. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to revere older people. When you had a disabled uh, brother or sister or sibling, they weren't left outside. If you had an uncle that was battling some kind of mental uh, illnesses, sometimes born out of, uh, out of wartime, you took care of your family. So a lot of these problems that we're seeing uh, infecting our society where we have to get in there now and have, a, and have some type of government solution is, is merely dealing with the symptom. Uh, what we have to do to attack this root problem is a heart issue, and it's an attitude that I think our culture, our media, YouTube, Netflix, all these Hollywood, the sports activists who love China all of a sudden, uh, they're, they're the ones that are feeding this kind of, these kind of thoughts into our, into our young people's minds. It's spilling out, it's, it's, it's making it a hard environment for people to get the support that they need. Uh, but ab above all, I think there are some issues that we can do. Uh, I know the Sheriff's Office does some, some kinds of things uh, as far as training uh, the youngsters to go ahead and get trained up for possible law enforcement careers. We need to look at avenues like that uh, to, to kind of get these kids trained up and to get these, uh, 
these folks that have some, some deficiencies or some deficits and challenges to even the playing field for them. Uh, I believe it comes from the nuclear family and then the, uh, the partnership with uh, the, the private community. That's good. Uh, thank you. And one of the things that I've, I've seen over the years um, being in the legislature is, is Opportunity Village. I, I know everybody knows Opportunity Village and the, and the great things that they do, exactly what you were just asking about. Um, this last legislative cycle, or 2019, I think it was last cycle, um, they had a bill that they wanted to raise the minimum wage for, for that program. And, and I just, we, we were successful in preventing them because they were trying to, I mean, just really stranglehold the, their programs. And um, to me, having an entity like Opportunity Village that can, that can provide the training and the job skills to, to try to help, um, that's important to me. And anything that we can do uh, to prevent 